All right, uh, thank you for joining everyone. Uh, today we have Andy from Beacon. Uh, he is going to you know, talk through some of the theory behind Beacon, uh, show us some live demos, and then go through a live coding session of incorporating Beacon into uh, different examples. So yeah, thanks for uh, joining today. Andy, uh, take it away. Okay, so yeah, thanks. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, today I'll talk a little bit about Beacon, what we've been working on and how, most importantly, how you can um, add it to your project and um, yeah, integrate it into your hackathon project, hopefully. So let me get started by sharing my screen. Okay, so let's see. Okay, there we go. So yeah, Beacon is basically something uh, we've built to allow you to connect um, Tesla steps to wallets. So first a little bit about me and about uh, where I work. I work at a company called Papers. Um, we've been basically focusing on mobile security and blockchain technology for some years. And we've been involved in the Tezos ecosystem since about two years. Uh, first, it started by integrating Tezos into our mobile wallet, AirGap. Um, <clears throat> we'll quickly touch AirGap simply because we, we will showcase a couple of beacon features by using AirGap. So we'll hear more about this later. And also one of the, the other projects is TestBlock, um, Tesla's Block Explorer that is focused on simplicity and yeah, overall user-friendly. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start by looking at the current state of uh, how that communication is at the moment. So um, basically, um, you probably all heard about MetaMask. So MetaMask is the most common method of connecting dApps to, to wallets on Ethereum. But um, wait, just one second. Um, now, uh, my friend just messaged me that he is still waiting. So maybe there is a problem with the stream that people are in the wrong one. In the wrong one. Uh, I think there are there is an attendee already, so I think people are able to join. Um, okay, so then, uh, well, sorry for the interruption. Then I guess he has the the wrong link. So let's continue. Um, yeah. So basically, currently, uh, MetaMask is the way to go if you're on Ethereum. It works pretty well. It has been around for a couple of years. Um, the key lives in the browser extension. So if you have a mobile wallet and you want to work with the app. Uh, then you have to basically transfer uh, your funds to the Chrome extension and then I'll work with it there. Um, <clears throat> the, there was also no um, permission concept in the beginning, which made, uh, there was kind of a migration period uh, and that was an issue in the beginning, but uh, they, they did fix that later on. There is also um, the Wallet Connect project, which is basically another standard that allows you to connect to mobile wallets directly from your dApps. But this uses a separate standard um, and is not out of the box compatible with MetaMask, as far as I know. Um, and it, the connection is going through a centralized server. So this is uh, what, what is basically uh, happening on, on Ethereum. And now uh, let's look at Tezos. There is TestBridge. Um, TestBridge takes kind of a novel approach that I've not seen in any other uh, blockchain projects or any other projects. Uh, the wallet basically lives in your browser in, yeah, in the, on their website, um, but it uses tap communication to, to communicate from your dApp to, uh, to the wallet basically. Um, this is interesting and it works pretty well. They also have ledger support. Um, yeah, and we basically try to take all of these things that are out there and combine them into something even better, which is why we came up with Beacon. So right uh, out of the box, one important thing that we, uh, we thought up when we thought about when building Beacon is that we would like to support browser extensions, but we would also like to support um, connecting to mobile wallets and desktop wallets out of the box. Because um, we believe that 
no matter where your wallet is, you should be able to use it in a dApp. You shouldn't be, it shouldn't be necessary that you um, create, you have to create another uh, wallet or mnemonic just for your extension so you can uh, play around with the dApp. It should be connected to your main account and to your main wallet, no matter where it is. And this should obviously be done sec securely. So um, entering your mnemonic into a website or a Chrome extension is not uh, the way to go. It should be in, inside your, your wallet. So this is why we chose a peer-to-peer -peer approach. So other than, it, it's similar to Wallet Connect, but Wallet Connect is using a centralized server. Beacon uses a peer-to-peer -peer network that is based on the matrix protocol. Um, so anyone who wants can uh, spin up a server and uh, participate in the network. Um, it's also important that with Beacon, both of these approaches work exactly the same way. So for the dApp developer, there is absolutely no difference, um, or well, there are slight differences, but in the grand scheme of things, there are no big differences between the two uh, methods. They actually get selected automatically for you, so you don't have to think about it. It just takes what the user is basically capable of or what he prefers. Okay, so then let's get to the first demo. Uh, here, we will basically, I, I will show you first the Chrome extension, how it works um, and how it interacts with the DAP. And then we'll take a look at how the same thing works with our mobile wallet, AirGap. Okay, so first, um, I already downloaded the extension. I'll quickly add it here. I don't have it added at the moment. Okay, so now let's also clear the cache and everything. So we start from a clean slate. And then we can really see how it works. Okay, so now everything is cleared. Let's refresh. So we can already see that here on the top right, we, it sees that we are connected uh, by a Chrome extension. So let's open it up for the first time. Uh, we will be greeted with this, um, with this prompt to set up the, the Chrome extension. We can either choose to pair a ledger, which basically means you, um, you give the, the extension permission to talk to the ledger and it takes your address. Um, we will also sh uh, soon enable the peer-to-peer -peer inside the Chrome extension, but so more on that later. That's not enabled just yet. Or we have a third option, the developer option, where we basically use a local mnemonic as you know from MetaMask. So let's do that. So here it generates a new mnemonic for us with an address. Obviously there are no fonts on it. So let me quickly take one that I generated before that has some fonts on it here. So we save that. And as we can see, now we have a Chrome extension here. We have our address, we have a, a balance and the network, which is mainnet. Okay, cool. So basically now the, the extension is set up and we're ready to go. So now let's start. So this is um, Wallet Beacon. The IO is basically an explanation of what Beacon is, but it is itself also a DAP to showcase how it works. So we can try it out here by clicking Connect Beacon. So as we can see here, the extension pop pops up and we get a permission prompt. So we can see the, the Beacon example that tries to connect to our account that we have just generated before. It is using mainnet. And here we can choose the permissions that we want to give. Let's just say we will give those permissions. Um, so it can sign transactions and it can handle operation requests. Perfect, okay. So um, now the Chrome extension disappears and our DAP has the permissions that we just set. We have gotten the, the address, the network that was specified, and also permissions that were um, given. Okay, cool. So as we can see in the top right now, we have the, um, the address. So everything is ready to go. Now, uh, there, there are some more explanations. I'll let you through that, uh, read through that on your own if you're interested. So down here, 
is the interesting part. So basically now um, we could start a simple transfer. Let's say I want to send 0 0.2 pesis, um, or let's take a little bit less because maybe we want to do more than, than one. Um, we want to send it to, let's send it to our test wallet, another one that we usually use. So we fill out the blanks and then we open the extension again. And as you can see, um, it here is the transaction that we, we specified. So this is the amount and this is the recipient. Now it also generated the reveal operation for us because it's a brand new address and we've never used it. So the public key needs to be revealed to the network, which is happening here. So it adds a reveal before and this is the Tezos transaction, the, yeah, the spend transaction. So now we can basically confirm and as we can see, it was broadcasted to the network. So yeah, that is basically already it. Um, there are other things you can do besides uh, an operation request. For example, I mean, you could on your DAP add a tipping button that just pre-fills the, the address. You could also do contract calls. I can't show that right now because um, this is a contract that is deployed on CartageNet, but we don't have any funds on CartageNet on this address. But um, let's, let's try it anyway because actually, as we can see, we also have error messages. So the, the DAP automatically gets um, notified if there is something wrong. So here it says parameters invalid. And in the Chrome extension, we see that, uh, well, we have an empty transaction. So either it's because it's zero or because we don't have funds. I think it's because we don't have funds. Yeah. Okay. So that was basically it for the Chrome extension part. Now let's do the same thing, but by using Beacon. So um, we, I'll go ahead and remove the Chrome extension. So this is, and also again, I'll store, I clear the local storage. Um, yeah, basically it wouldn't be necessary to clear the local storage. It's just um, also to show you like how, how it would work if you, if you start off clean. So let's refresh. Cool. So now, as we can see on the top right, we are connected to Beacon, or Beacon connected and not the Chrome extension. So on the right side, you can see my mobile phone. Um, now is the time where I have to quickly talk about AirGap. So AirGap is, is a mobile wallet. It supports a couple of currencies, um, Tezos, of course, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a couple of others. Um, and um, it's, it, it's mainly focused on security. So the idea we have or we had um, is we would build two separate apps. That, as you can see here, we have the AirGap wallet and we have the AirGap vault. The vault is an app that is completely offline. So it never talks to any node. It never has an internet connection, nothing. It only stores your private keys and it can also and should be uh, installed on another phone. So every time you want to do a transaction, you have the AirGap wallet, which we will see right now. Um, you can see your balances, you can see your accounts and everything, but as soon as you need to sign something, uh, then it will connect either if you have it on the same device via app switching, or if you have it on two devices via Q QR codes. Uh, so it, the private key never leaves the secure app. Okay. So um, this is important just because afterwards we see how the app switches and um, it's important that people don't get confused. So um, yeah, we are inside the app now and let's go back to the DAP and click connect beacon again. So now it's a little different. So because we don't have a Chrome extension installed, the, the SDK or the DAP knows that it cannot talk to a Chrome extension, but rather it needs to use the peer-to-peer the -peer wallet connection. So we get a QR code, which basically contains the public key of our, um, of our DAP. And this is an internal public key for communication. So this has nothing to do with any of your Tezos accounts. So this is purely for communication purposes. So now on the wallet side, on the mobile side, I can open the camera and scan the QR code. And now it's establishing a connection. And as we can see, 
um, after some seconds of connecting, we get the permission request from the dev. It's the same UI as we've seen before. We can give different permissions. Again, let's give the same ones. And I click connect. And then we have to quickly wait. And again, in the dev, we get the permissions from the, the wallet. Yeah, uh, so okay, now I cannot scroll. Let's refresh. OK. Um, yeah, so now the, the DAP and the wallet, they are paired. So if you, we go to the wallet, we can see here in the settings, we have a connection to the example DAP. And we also have permissions given that we could remove. Because um, of course, permissions are enforced on both sides. So if you remove permissions or, or like a communication from your wallet, the DAP is not able to talk to your wallet anymore. But for now, we will leave it. Go back to the index screen. And now let's try out this custom Tezos operation. So we have, again, um, a regular transaction with this amount to this address. Or let's, let's send money to our other test account so we don't lose it <laughs> and make the amount a little bit smaller. So now let now that I've started the, the request, we saw that there is a, is a pop-up on the, on the wallet. And we can check the data and continue. And now this is basically the air gap approach. So this is only specific to air gap. This is not uh, specific to beacon. So what we have to do now is we have to leave the air gap wallet, go to the air gap vault where the key is stored to sign the operation and then go back. So let's choose the same device. The other app opens. We see uh, the same transaction again. We can confirm again that everything is as we want it. Assign it, send it back. We have a last confirmation screen. And now I can broadcast it. So now, as we can see, the transaction has been broadcast to the network. The wallet gave us um, feedback from its side. And also in the background, it sent uh, the confirmation to the uh, to the website, to the DAP. So here we can see it has been broadcast and we have the transaction hash. And now we could open the Block Explorer and as soon as it is included, it would show up here. Cool. So yeah, um, I think that's it for the first demo. So now we've seen um, how basically the a DAP can talk to first the extension, but also to and uh, a mobile application over the peer-to-peer -peer network. Cool. So let's go back here. OK. So now let's take a look what Beacon actually is. So Beacon is um, basically an implementation of the TZIP 10 standards. TZIP are Tezos improvement proposals. Um, and this um, communication has been specified in this TZIP 10 and Beacon simply implements it. We also changed it a little bit because we, this is the first and so far, as far as I know, only implementation that is out there at the moment. So we, we had to tweak it a little. Um, Beacon is, or the Beacon SDK is a TypeScript library. There will be others for mo native mobile apps, so Swift and um, Java or Kotlin for Android but they are still in the very early planning phase. So um, at the moment, it's just TypeScript or JavaScript. Um, yeah, it basically handles the communication between a DAP and the wallet or extension. It, as already mentioned, it automatically selects the, which uh, transport to use. And also important to note is that we released a version one of Beacon uh, last week. So we did some extensive testing internally. We also had some, uh, some beta tests of other dApps. Um, and we, we've uh, fixed all the bugs. But um, fingers crossed that there are not uh, many still left. Because so far, we, we haven't encountered any since we won release. OK, so now let's get a little bit more technical about what the Beacon SDK actually does for you. So it basically manages the state for you. So um, it persists everything in local storage. So as I mentioned before, every, um, every Beacon SDK client, or let's say every DAP or every wallet that is Beacon compatible, 
uh, locally generates a, a key pair, a public and a private key. This key pair is used for, um, communica for communication. So when establishing this peer-to-peer -peer communication, as we've seen before with scanning the QR, um, the, the QR contains the public key of the, uh, of the DAP. The wallet scans this, then locally uh, encrypts its own pri uh, public key with the public key that it just scanned, sends it over the network to the, with the recipient um, like public key of the DAP. And then that way both parties have the, the public key of each other and they can start um, um, their encrypted channel. So I already mentioned, uh, I already mentioned that Beacon selects the transport automatically. I think I've mentioned that a couple of times already. <laughs> but it is quite a cool part of it. Um, it also manages all the peer-to-peer -peer peers that are, there are. So it, uh, as we s we've seen before, um, basically when you reload the page, it automatically reconnects and, and you can remove peers and then it disconnects and so on. It also manages all the accounts and permissions for you. So accounts are basic, basically every address on every network is a different account for us. So if you um, request permissions on PartageNet for a, an account, this is, or for an address, this is one account. And then you can also ask for permissions on mainnet and this will be handled as a different account. Um, this, the SDK also enforces these permissions that have been given per network. So if you, want to do something on, on mainnet after you've been try testing it out on, on CarthageNet, even though it's the same, it might be the same address, you have to go through the permission request uh, step again. That's obviously for security reasons, so uh, the user cannot be tricked into thinking he is on CarthageNet, whereas he is actually operating on mainnet and might uh, put his, his mainnet funds at risk. Um, there is also always one act uh, account active in the SDK, which is the one that is used when when doing any kind of when sending any kind of operation, and also we um, provide standard UI elements for most of the events that um, are happening. So I'm sure you you saw before that there were alerts for um, the QR codes every like on success we had some information about the address with a, a button that opens the block. Block Explorer. There was also on the uh, bottom right, like a sending request toast. All of these things uh, happen automatically. You don't have to do anything. But of course, if you don't want them and you want to customize the UI, uh, you can overwrite the, these events and add your custom UI. There's also documentation available for um, the Beacon SDK under docs.walletbeacon.io, where you can read more. Okay, so yeah, um, I think we've already covered this, but this here will visualize how um, basically the, the initial startup of the, the SDK is and how it selects where requests go. And after this, we will go through a couple of um, sequence diagrams to see what is happen happening internally. So here we start at the, the depth point and it, at, it first checks if the, the extension is installed. This is done by doing a small ping pong. So it basically asks, is there anything, is there anyone uh, that speaks Beacon? And if yes, um, it goes and talks to the extension. If not, um, then it will initiate the peer-to-peer -peer connection and connect to the wallet directly. Once uh, the, an extension is detected, there are two different things that can happen. They are, here I have to say, this is not yet implemented, but it should be coming in the next couple of days or weeks, like one or two weeks at most. So, um, but let's just assume it's already there. Then what you can, or what happens in the extension is, you can actually also pair your wallet over the peer-to-peer -peer network um, with your extension. What that means is that then the extension basically becomes uh, an invisible relay for your messages. So the DAP will send a request to the extension and 
the extension without popping up or opening or doing anything. It will just relay the request to your wallet. The big advantage of this is that you don't have to um, pair the, your wallet with every dApp that you want to interact with. You only have to pair it once in your extension and then um, from there, every dApp you visit can use it. Um, but if this is not the case, which for now, because it's not implemented, is always the case, then you can either choose to use a local mnemonic for development purposes, or you can use your ledger to interact with the dApp. So yeah, um, I think this might be a bit um, yeah, too much, so I'll, I'll quickly go through those. Um, we have a, uh, here in this diagram, we can see we have three parties. Uh, for those of you who don't know how Chrome extensions work, they basically have a background task that is always running. And then they have a foreground task, which is called the pop-up. That's also what you see that just, um, that's only, that only lives when you actually see the extension and when it pops up. But the background, it always lives um, in the, or is active in the background, even though you don't see it. So what happens in a regular permission request with, to the extension is that the dev sends over um, window.post post message, it sends a request to the background. The background um, does some checks. In this case, it will not deny the request because of course, a permission request has to be done even when no permissions have been given in the past. It will send it to the pop-up, the pop-up will will show up, the user can confirm, and then the response will be sent back, or the error if the, if the user doesn't accept. Similar thing for the um, operation request here, basically a bit more happens. Um, when you send the request to the background, the background first fetches all the data that are um, necessary from the network. So for example, the counter, it calculates the fee, it, it I mean, in a technical manner, it does the run operation um, of the Tezos node. So you also get um, errors if, for example, you don't have enough funds or if in your contract call, you have some, some syntax error or whatever. So that you will immediately get um, feedback. But if, if the fetching of the, of the data succeeds, then as we've seen before, the pop-up opens, you, you already see all the information uh, there, and then you can um, yeah, uh, confirm it, and it goes back, it gets forged, it gets signed in the background, and then uh, sent back to the dev. So in the, when we take a look at the uh, dev talking directly to a wallet, so uh, no Chrome extension involved, we have to have an additional step, which was uh, the one we saw before. We have to show a QR code to um, have the public key exchange. So this is pretty simple, as we've seen before. Show the QR code, scan it in the wallet, and then um, it goes back to the dApp, and then the connection is established. After that, it is um, pretty straightforward. DAP requests something, user accepts it, and it goes back. All, uh, and all of this happens over the peer-to-peer -peer network. And the same for the operation request. So now it gets a little bit more interesting, which is when um, basically the peer-to-peer, -peer, when we want to add peer-to-peer -to, -peer to the wallet, uh, to the extension, sorry. So as I've said before, what, um, by having this background doing most of the work, what this allows us to do is that when a, um, when a, oh, wait, wait, let me check. Ah, so this is actually, um, uh, this is the initialization, sorry. So I've already skipped ahead. So basically what this means here is that the, the dap or on the pop-up is here, the driving force. So you have to open the, the pop-up, you click on pair and then the QR gets shown. Uh, you scan it with your wallet and then basically you have um, initiated the connection and the background is connected to your wallet. This is important. So the background is connected and not the pop-up because this means that now that the DAP is again in the, in the driver's seat and is starting the, the request, it will send the request to the background and without triggering the, the pop-up, so you won't see anything, 
it immediately sends um, the request or it forwards the request to the wallet. And then same thing as usual, user can uh, confirm and it goes back. And the same thing goes for the operation request. So basically the Chrome extension becomes a simple relay without any user interface, if the user chooses that, of course. And this is quite powerful because it means that you don't have to, um, you don't have to sync or pair with every app that you want to use. You can just download the Chrome extension, pair once, and then use it on every app that supports Beacon. Okay. So yeah, um, now let's look a bit more at the, the different message types that have been defined in the TZIP 10 standard. So um, there are four types. There's the permission request, the operation, and both of those we've seen. There is also the sign request and the broadcast. So let's take a look at each of them um, individually. Ah, first, this is basically a sample request how this thing, um, how it is done in the in your dApp. I think we can skip this for now because we will see that in the live coding session afterwards how this um, how this actually works. So let's look at those four um, at those four messages. So there is a every message has a, a defined interface with some properties but they are actually not that important to the developer. You can look them, them up in the SDK or, or also in our docs, but um, what actually matters to the developers is this. So when you, do a, uh, when you start a request, a permission request in this case, you can specify two things. You can specify the network where this is, um, where the permissions are requested. Um, the network can be either mainnet or cartridge net, or it can be a custom one. And you can also provide a name and a, an RPC URL. Um, all of these networks are basically handled uniquely. So if you have, if you request permissions for mainnet and you provide your own RPC URL um, and you add, ask for permissions with, with that network, later on you have to use the same RPC again because um, otherwise someone could swap out the URL and trick someone into thinking um, that they are on another network than that they, where they actually are. So um, the network has to always be the same one when you work with a specific account. Um, the scopes, in the input you can define basically which scopes you want. If you want to have the sign um, scope or the the operation request scope. Usually you want especially the operation request uh, scope because then you can do pretty much everything or the most important ones. And then um, what's also important is what you as a developer get back from the SDK. So when you do, and maybe now we can quickly go back to visualize what, what is actually happening. We go back to how this looks um, from the developer side. So you import the dApp client from our SDK, you instantiate it by giving it a name, um, and then you just call um, client.request permissions, and you can pass in optionally all the things that, uh, like the network and the scopes, but um, default is mainnet and um, sign and uh, operation request as a permission scope. And the response is basically what you get back. So everything happens inside this one line of code um, for you. So no matter if it's Chrome extension or if it's, um, it's over the peer-to-peer -peer network, it just um, awaits as long as it takes for the answer to be there. So um, in the case of peer-to-peer, -peer, it will, on this line, it will show the QR code, it will wait until the connection is established, will show the, um, the permission request in the wallet. And then once the user finally accepts, it will continue and you have in your response um, these things. So the beacon ID is basically the, the public key of the, of the wallet. This helps you to um, identify or it could help the user to identify that there was no 
uh, well, spoofing involved. I mean, here, a small asterisk, this um, could potentially still be done, um, but we'll get to that later. Um, <clears throat> you also get back the address of the network and uh, the scopes that have actually been given by the user. So yeah, um, that I think should be pretty clear. Then we have the next one, the operation request. This is the, the big one. This is the one um, where you will probably do most of your, of your work because this is where you do transfers, um, spends, where you do contract calls, all of those things. So basically you again uh, can optionally supply a network where you want to run this on. And also you can hand um, in or you have to pass in a, a partial Tezos operation. So partial is, is, bit of, is a bit of a wild card here. Um, we might add better typings for this later, but what this basically means is that you don't have to provide all the property that are mandatory in a Tezos operation. Why is that? That's simply because um, the, the wallet or the extension will do some of the work. As we've seen before, um, for example, fetching the counter or uh, calculating the fee, that is something that should be done by the wallet. Also because the wallet might provide some, some UI where you can uh, adjust the fee if you want to pay a higher fee or I don't know. So for example, if we take a spend, um, the only things we have to define in this partial Tezos operation is the, the type, the amount that we want to send and the recipient. Everything else like storage limit, gas limit, those will be um, calculated by the wallet. And again, then the wallet does its thing, the user confirms, and then what you get back is the transaction hash and again, the beacon ID. Then this one, the sign request is a new one. We haven't seen it um, in this demo. Um, basically it behaves very similarly, but the difference is that you just provide, um, provide it with a payload, a string that you want to be signed. And also you can provide a source address which um, will be basically pre-selected in the wallet. So if the DAP is already aware of which um, address that should be do doing the signing, it can set the source address. Um, and as a response, you get back again, the beacon ID and the signature. And the broadcast request, same story. Uh, you de define a network where you want the broadcast to happen. You provide a signed transaction. So this one has to be um, forged and signed and the wallet basically just broadcasts it and gives you back the hash. Yeah, okay. So now maybe the question you've all been been asking yourselves is how can we work with contracts with Beacon? So one important thing about Beacon is that it doesn't provide any contract call abstractions and it also doesn't connect to any Tezos RPCs itself. It purely focuses on the transport layer. And that is also how, in my opinion, it should be because that's um, well, what Beacon does. It selects where your request goes, how the connection is established, reconnects and all of these things, but it doesn't give you very high level um, abstractions for con contracts. So this is where Takito comes in. Um, I'm sure most of you who've worked with uh, smart contracts uh, on Tezos are familiar with Takito. It's, a, it's an, a TypeScript library as well. And they provide uh, a high level abstraction of contracts. So basically they, um, you can provide the, your um, address where your contract lives and then they, uh, you can invo invoke methods on it and they will give you like um, a feedback if the, the entry point is wrong or unknown or if you provide the wrong number of arguments and all of these things. So Takito, we've been closely working together with Takito and they're now um, building a new wallet API that also includes Beacon as, a, as an option. Um, I think test bridge is also one of the, uh, the options. I think those are the only two, if I remember correctly. Um, their branch is, is out there on GitHub. Um, they also have some, some beta releases and we will actually show that um, 
afterwards, how that works. So if you want to work with contracts, then probably you would want to use Taquito with the Beacon wallet inside. Then you get all the benefits of, that I showed you during the presentation, like connection to the extension to the wallet over peer-to-peer -peer out of the box, but with an additional um, layer of extraction, abstraction for contracts. Okay, so now we get to the second part, and this is a live coding, which is always a bit tricky, but let's hope it works well. So um, let me quickly get my ID up. So the code here that I'm showing here is, um, or the finished code is available on GitHub. Uh, I'll, yeah, you just saw the link. I'll show it again later and it will be available in Discord as well. So let's take a look. So this is basically the a very, very small um, dApp that we are going to build. Uh, beforehand, I have to say, usually I work with Angular. This is actually the first time I've worked with Vue.js. Um, it was quite nice, but there might be some, uh, some things I'm not doing correctly, so forgive me if there are any Vue.js pros. But basically, um, <clears throat> it's going, going to be a very simple step. First, we sh um, request the permissions, then we send an operation, and then we do a contract call with Taquito. So, Currently, I just have alerts for all of these things. They don't do anything. Okay, let's, um, I think for now we don't need the wallet. That actually, yeah, no, let's, I have almost too many windows. So um, let me quickly take the example code. So uh, let's quickly go over the code here. So as we can see, we have, um, regular HTML, so we have yeah, the button with a click handler and yeah, three times basically. And here we show something, uh, some variables, but they are undefined at the moment, so that's why they don't show up here. Um, <clears throat> I already went ahead and I installed the, the AirGap Beacon SDK and also the Taquito Beacon Wallet um, wallet provider. So they are already in store, installed uh, and imported, but they are not used yet. So if we take a look here, this is all the code that exists for now. So we have some, uh, some properties there, address, the scopes, and two of the hashes, um, and these three methods that we've seen. And now we are going to integrate the whole thing from scratch and hopefully see how, how easy it is to do. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is actually um, create an instance of our um, of the DAP client of the Beacon SDK. So here, I actually can copy paste the most of the code, so you don't have to see me write write this. And we can delete this for now. So basically, what this line of code does is we create a new DAP client, we give it the name, view DAP, and we store it in this class, and that's it. So we now have a reference to the, to the DAP client, and now we can go ahead and add the code that does the permission request. So this is the code that does the permission request. So as you can see here, we access um, our DAP client, we do request permissions, and we can optionally pass in um, a network. Let's just leave this for now. So we pass in a network of type CarthageNet. For CarthageNet and Mainnet, we don't have to provide uh, an RPC URL. We have a, a default one, but if you want, you could, um, uh, you could overwrite it here, but we, we are not going to do that. Cool, so this, uh, these lines of code, they basically do the, the request. And here we get the response. So what we have to do is we have to take the response and store those um, in, inside our, our properties so they can be displayed in the UI. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I've been testing beforehand. So again, here 
I really need to. I do need to store the local storage, so we don't have anything from before. Let's refresh. Okay, so let's give this a try. Um, we don't have any Chrome extension installed, so this will trigger the QR code as expected. Now, go back here. Okay, so this is again my, my mobile wallet. Again, I'll open the scanner, scan the QR code, and we are connected. So now, again, we can, let's this time choose different permissions, click connect, and after a couple of seconds, oh, I forgot to delete the alert, but here we get back um, the response. So as we can see here, we have the default UI element that um, we did not, we didn't have to do anything. This just shows up where you can see the, the scopes and the network and the, the address. But also here we see the, the properties that we have um, defined here in our UI. So yeah, cool, that worked. Um, now let's, let's remove those because they're just annoying if they happen again. So now let's move on. Uh, that's basically it for the permission request. So even though now if I reload, this will not show up again, but internally, um, I mean, we could check in the local storage. Internally, this account is still stored. So we still have the, the address and, and the network and everything. It's just like here, I would have to get the account uh, from local storage again and assign the properties. I just didn't do that yet. But you, you're free to do that depending on your UI. Okay, so now let's go to the second demo. Here, we want to do an operation request. And then copy quickly copying the snippet. So that's it already. So what we are going to do here is, okay, there's a small error. Ah, yeah, it's an empty method, it cannot be empty. Okay, that was an easy fix, good. <laughs> um, so yeah, here we again, we take the reference to the to our dApp client. We do request operations this time, and we pass in one of these partial Tezos operations. And as I've mentioned before, um, we have an array of um, partial operations. We have the kind, which is a transaction, we have an amount, and we have a destination, which is one of our um, test accounts. So now, yeah, um, we, can do this, we get the response, we read out the transaction hash and store it locally. And yeah, that's basically already it. If we do this now, then oh, I, my phone locked again. But we can see, we got the request. We can see where the request came from. It's from the view app. We can see the details. And I think I, I won't go through the, the process again. Um, if, or yeah, let's just quickly. So I'm going back to the other app, signing the transaction and broadcasting it. And we should be getting the result shortly. Yes. So again, we got to get the default UI and we get the, the operation hash here. Okay. So um, that leaves us with the last one and the contract call. So here um, it's not, I, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, at the moment, this is a bit weird because we have basically two beacon or dApp client instances, instances in one dApp. So you would obviously only have one or the other. So if you are planning to interact with contracts and do complex things, you should probably only use what we, we are doing now with Takito and you shouldn't have to do that manually um, because that will be happening inside of Takito. But if you, if all you want to do in your dApp is um, the things that you've seen here, so basically getting the, the account of someone to check his balance or um, maybe doing some, some simple delegate or, or, or spend operations, then you could do it exactly as I've shown you here. Okay, so let's go here. Um, so basically what we do first here is instead of instantiating 
adapt client that is imported from the Beacon SDK, we actually instantiate a Beacon wallet that is imported from the, from the Takito module. So we create our wallet instance here. And then Tezo, uh, Takito provides this, um, they call it, I think it's tool, toolkit, uh, Tezos toolkit. And that basically allows you to uh, set some, some things on, that will be used later on. So we use this uh, Tezos toolkit to set the wallet provider uh, to the speaking wallet provider. And then we have to do the permission request. So um, here we have to do the request again, even though we, we, we made it here simply because, uh, yeah, as I've said before, those two are basically separate instances. Um, but yeah, let's just, uh, if you would only use Takito, you would only have to do this once and not two times. So now um, after we, we wait for the permissions, the difference is here, um, it doesn't actually return the permissions to you. So it just keeps them internally because internally it will, uh, Takito will work with those permissions internally. Um, the next thing we want, we want to do is we want to connect to our contract. So we do this by using this Tezos toolkit dot wallet at, and then we provide the contract um, address. And th in this case of TCBTC, but you can use any contract on mainnet in this case. Okay, so now we have uh, basically a reference to this contract. The last thing we have to do is actually call a method. So the TCBTC contract is uh, quite complex and it has a lot of entry points. We will just do a simple transfer for now. So we do contract.methods and then this is basically dynamically generated um, by looking at the actual contract and we pass in three parameters, the from, the to, and the amount, and then we say send. And that's basically it. The last thing is just taking the, the result the resulting hash and storing it in a local variable. Yeah, so let's give this a try. Um, okay, I'm gonna unlock my phone again and click this button. So first, again, we have to, um, we have to request the permissions. So let's give them. Okay, permissions have been granted. Immediately thereafter, the next request is being sent. And now we can see um, we have a contract call. So actually the UI here is a bit wrong, but it should show one TZBTC, but let's ignore that for now. Here we can see the, the details. So we see we send zero XTC here. Um, this is the contract address, the entry point, then this has been generated by Takito. And down here we have a fee, gas limit, and the counter. Okay, so we continue as usual with the air gap flow. So we switch over to the other um, app, we sign our transaction, switch back to the online app and broadcast it to the network. Yes, so that is it. So basically now um, a co this contract call has been prepared, given to your wallet, signed and broadcast all in about 30 seconds. And this would work exactly the same way without any changes um, in your Chrome extension if you didn't have um, the wallet. So uh, maybe one, here one thing I have to say, one limitation of currently of AirGap is that it only supports mainnet. So if you want to operate on CartageNet or any testnet, you'll have to use the Chrome extension for now. We will of course update this later on. Okay, so um, let's, uh, <laughs> I tried to scroll on my computer, on my phone thing. So let's see if we should actually, oh yeah, here we can see, this is the transaction that we just did, um, yeah, right now. Yeah, so I think this almost concludes the, the live demo. Um, there is one thing that I want to sh just quickly show and that's basic, basically, overwriting the default behavior. So for example, um, uh, you, if you don't want that 
um, the QR code shows up because you want to have your own model or whatever, then you can go here in the, in, in the instantiation of the, of the dev client, you can paste in this thing. Okay, uh, live coding. I'll just copy over the whole thing. Ah, yeah, I forgot the event handlers. So basically here you can overwrite a, any of the events that we uh, emit internally. Uh, you can also add back the default behavior if you choose to, but you don't have to. So let's for now just comment this out. Um, and if I save this now, and now I think the easiest, because we already have the connection set up and we over, overwrote the, the QR um, alert. Um, let, let me just quickly clear the local storage again. Now, if we refresh the page, and I need to show the, the console, if we do request permission, we cannot see any, um, any alert because we have disabled and overwritten it but we can see the sync info here, which is basically what the wallet needs to scan. So you can create your own QR code with this data. And basically any UI elements that you see can be overwritten this way. So the sending request uh, toast, also the, the alerts that you get, everything can be overwritten. Um, yeah, good. Um, I think that is it. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so yeah, um, we now saw how this all works in the in the DEP. And now just quickly, um, we also provide a wallet client that is meant to be used on the other side. So basically how it works is in Beacon always, the, the DEP is always the initiator of a communication. So the DEP always sends a request and the, the wallet handles that request and sends a response always. So that's why here, um, if you happen to develop a wallet, but I think that this is not really um, during a hackathon that, that sounds like a, a very difficult thing to do <laughs> in such a short time. Um, but nevertheless, who knows? Um, you also instantiate this wallet client and then you call in it, which basically um, establishes the peer to peer connection. And then here you have a connect um, callback where you basically get all the messages that are received over the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. And then once you handle this request, you, you sign the transaction, whatever, then you just call, uh, yeah, it should be client.respond with your response. And this will be sent back to the, to the DAP. Yes. But, um, this is being used in our uh, wallet, which is also open source. So if you, if you would like to do that, then just reach out to me and uh, I'll help you get this set up. Okay, so uh, we're coming to an end. Now let's talk quickly about what is basically uh, the future of, um, of Beacon. So at the moment, the only real DAP is our uh, example DAP, the wallet Beacon IO DAP. Uh, but Dexter, um, the decentralized exchange, has also um, started working on a beacon. Uh, like they integrated Beacon over a month ago, and we've been closely working together with them. They actually have a um, a public beta going on. Um, if you want, you can reach out to me, uh, and I can give you the sign up link where you can register for that beta. Um, but hopefully, during the hackathon, many many more depths that we can add to the list here will be built. Um, as for wallets, there is currently only our own wallet, AirGap wallet, supporting the standard, but we know that the Galleon wallet and also the Magma wallet, um, they are planning to integrate Beacon. It, um, I, I don't know what the state is. We haven't been in close contact uh, in the last weeks but they did uh, tell us that they want to integrate it. And now that version 1.0 has re been released, we will reach out again and get this going. Um, as for extensions, the, the Beacon extension is probably the most complete um, way of interacting with a DAP at the moment because it supports test nets and everything. And we also know that the 
uh, Thanos wallet, they are also inter interested in adding Beacon. But I don't know what the status there is. And libraries, um, Takito, as you've seen before, they um, have a beta version with Beacon integration. Yeah, um, and then quickly, some of the next steps that we've been thinking of. Um, one of the most important things is definitely the push notification oracle, because as, you, uh, as you've seen before, uh, the, the communication happens, or when a message is received in the, in the wallet, you have no way of, um, well, the phone doesn't know when this happens, so you, the, the, the app has to be open. And we hope that we can, or no, I mean, we know that we can solve this by using push notifications. So you will also get the push notification uh, when you get the message. We also want to uh, add deep linking support. So you can, uh, for example, easily sync uh, a desktop wallet using the peer-to-peer -peer network, but if possible, also on mobile. We also uh, thought about adding signatures to the actual messages that are being sent um, simply to be able to verify that the origin is actually um, correct and cannot be spoofed anymore. And also another thing is that we might um, add permissionless requests. So basically at the moment you have to ask for permissions always before you do any kind of operation. Um, but for example, we could see a use case for um, if you want, if you have a website and you just want to add a simple button like tip us or delegate to us, that if you click this button through the extension like that is paired to your wallet, it will immediately um, send this request even though you don't have um, specific permissions to use any account. Uh, we're looking into that. Of course, uh, one of the the challenges there is that you, you need to protect the wallet from spam, basically. Yes, so that is it. Um, yeah, I hope it was understandable and interesting. I'm available on, on Discord and also uh, any other medium where you can find us. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to help you integrate Beacon. Um, it is I would say it's it's stable now with the 1.0 release, but um, the documentation is something that we're still working on. So um, if you if you don't get it working after a couple of minutes, then there might be something wrong. So it's better to just reach out uh, and we can solve it together. Not that you are spending half a day trying to get it to work. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be it from my side. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Andy. This is a Super comprehensive. Um, yeah, so as usual, this workshop will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, so if uh, you want to revisit any of the material, you can go there. And um, as Andy mentioned, um, you can find developer support and help in the different, uh, in, in Discord and also in the different office hour session, sessions that will start taking place next week. So yeah, thank you guys for your time and uh, thank you again, Andy. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Bye.